Hello, and welcome to Valley Forge Beef and Ale Restaurant in beautiful downtown Valley Forge and the Agora IO Unconference. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Ken Crawcha. I will be your MC for today. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers. For the next five hours, we will be treating you to a, one after the other host of some of the finest libertarian speakers that we have to offer. This is part of the overall Agora Unconference with over 100 astounding libertarian speakers now being broadcast live over the internet on two separate channels. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our sponsors who made all this happen. They include the AMCAP Entrepreneur Network, Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedoms Phoenix, Free King, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWon'tFly.com. Like to thank our sponsors for making all this happen. So let's get rolling. Our first speaker is James Bad. James is a Philadelphia area libertarian activist, a homeschooling dad, and a small business owner. He's the co-founder of WeWon'tFly.com and also the founder of the Valley Forge Revolutionaries who meet in this fine establishment. He's also involved in many other freedom fighting projects in the Delaware Valley here, including juror rights education, end the Fed, and others as along those lines. James says he accepts only anarchy as the political philosophy that's consistent with the non-aggression principle. And as an example of that, we'll be speaking today on moving the TSA resistance forward. Please join me in welcoming James Babb. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome to the Valley Forge Beef and Ale. As Ken mentioned, this is the home of the Valley Forge Revolutionaries. It's an important headquarters for our local freedom movement. I'd like to thank the Agora IO Unconference creator, George Donnelly. I've had the privilege of working with George on several projects, several projects including juror rights outreach and We Won't Fly. And it's always a privilege to work with George. Uh, there are very few activists that I know that have the, the rare combination of libertarian principles, uh, a fine skill set, and also a, a drive. So it's, it's an honor, uh, again, to work with George on this project. I'd like to thank all the other speakers, the sponsors, and our MC Ken Krawchuk. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here and our audience online. Please use the chat window to communicate with us. Uh, the fun part of an event like this is the interactivity, so please enter your comments or questions. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Valley Forge Revolutionaries uh, for presenting this live segment of the Unconference. I'm going to talk about the current TSA resistance movement and some ideas that I have to take it to the next level, but first I want to use this opportunity for a shameless plug of our local freedom movement. Uh, I have the utmost respect for our friends in Keene, New Hampshire, and Phoenix, Arizona, but I really think that our Philly crew can hold their own against, uh, against any of these guys. So um, whether it's the rallies, educational events, or direct action operations, Philly's a great location for freedom activism. So uh, I'm proud to share the stage today with some of our great activists. Uh, Philly has hosted one of the largest Ron Paul rallies in history. We have active student groups like student, Students for Liberty, um, Student Liberty Front at many of our major universities. We have boisterous and the Fed and anti-war rallies, survival workshops, films. There's events virtually every week. Uh, the Valley Forge Revolutionaries was founded during the 2007 Ron Paul Revolution to spread libertarian philosophy. We're engaged in multiple fronts in the struggle for freedom. We support property rights by opposing eminent domain with public demonstrations, and the Fed, TSA protests, juror rights pamphleting, and educational events like this one. The common thread 
that links all of our events together as that we want to advance individual freedom and we want to have a fun time doing it. We recently participated in the nationwide Lemonade Freedom Day. Uh, it was a family friendly event where we sold lemonade in Rittenhouse Square without permits, of course. Rob Fernandez, the organizer of the National Lemonade Freedom Day, will be joining us later today. On October 1st, we'll be participating in Operation Trash the Curfew. Nick Shanklin will be telling us more about this later today as well. Uh, we'll also be supporting the upcoming Philadelphia conferences, including Nullify Now and the Fed and the Philadelphia Peace Fair, which Darren Wolf will tell us about. One of our most important operations is Juror Rights Outreach, both in Philadelphia and here at our Montgomery County Courthouse. Many of us have been inspired by the work of Julian Heitland to educate the public about the juror's right and duty to judge not just the facts of the case, but the law itself. So please consider joining us. We have a regular pamphleting operation at the Montgomery, at the Montgomery County Courthouse. It's remarkably easy, and we really need more people to, to join us there so we can make sure that every juror has an opportunity to learn about their rights. You never know when you're going to be on the receiving end of the justice system. You're certainly going to want your jurors to be fully informed. So you never really know which operation is going to take off. Uh, some of our activities get noticed by local media, but one of our most successful operations grew into a nationwide movement, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. We Won't Fly was founded a year ago by myself and George Donnelly. Uh, when I learned that the TSA's new invasive procedures were coming to Philly, I wanted to organize a local demonstration to educate people about the dangers and raise awareness uh, about the x-ray scanners and the gropings that were, at the time, relatively unknown. George immediately jumped in. He built a great website and a blog, and thanks to his savvy and some key blog posts, uh, it exploded all over the internet. Uh, then the old media heard, picked it up. Next thing you know, we were getting bombarded around the clock by national and international media. The reasons for our opposition were, were very clear from the start. Uh, privacy was a main concern. Uh, the x-ray scanners were taking new pictures of travelers, even children. These scans were so detailed that government employees can tell if a man is circumcised or if a woman is menstruating. There's no way in hell I was going to let my family be subjected to this. Health concerns were also very important. Uh, numerous medical experts expressed concerns about the carcinogenic radiation exposure. Although the bureaucrats just kept saying it was safe, they refused to allow an independent evaluation. Months later, they admitted that their own estimate of radiation exposure was off by a factor of 10. This was supposedly an honest mistake. We still have no idea how much radiation is actually being imposed on travelers by a properly functioning machine, a malfunctioning machine could be even more nasty. Even if we take their claims as truthful, statistically, the radiation from scanners poses as much of a risk as terrorism. In addition to the radiation strip search, many travelers are being subjected to a euphemistically labeled enhanced pat-down. The blue shirts were putting hands up legs, pressing against genitals, putting hands on breasts, between buttocks. These techniques were being used against any traveler who didn't scan well, usually due to artificial joints or implants. The elderly and those with disabilities were taking the brunt of the abuse. Then the TSA admitted that these pat-downs were also a punitive measure to be used against those who opted out of the virtual strip search. Security was also a concern. Experts in the field of airport security trashed the TSA's operation as nothing but security theater. The TSA apologists attempted to explain the loss of freedom as necessary to keep us safe. But it was apparent from the start that the TSA was at best creating a false sense of security and doing absolutely nothing to make anyone safer. Thanks to the efforts of the TSA resistance movement over the past year, most people are now well aware of the abuse of TSA tactics. In fact, TSA jokes are now, now permeate our culture. 
The less known talking point that I want to emphasize today is the gaping security hole that the TSA has created. I think this may become the most compelling reason yet to abolish the TSA in fear-stricken America. Having been hastily created as a reactionary make-work program, the Department of Homeland Security rapidly hired tens of thousands of blue-shirted guards. They didn't have time for in-depth screening. They just ran as many pizza box ads as they could and filled the ranks with just about anybody seeking a petty power trip. To understand, understand the scope of the TSA created security risk, we need to understand the level of integrity that we're dealing with. The resulting scandals of the past year would be laughable if they weren't so tragic. We need to take a look at some of the recent scandals from top management down to the blue shirted brokers. A Google search for TSA lies yesterday generated 6.2 million hits. This is up from 5.4 million just six months ago. So folks are catching on that these people can't be trusted to ever tell the truth. The TSA claimed that their state-of-the-art technology cannot store, print, transmit, or save an image. But our friends at the Electronic Privacy Information Center obtained documents that show that despite their claims, the TSA actually requires all of these capabilities, image storing, printing, and transmission as part of the contract specifications for the body scanners. Epic caught them in a bulb-based lock. They couldn't even tell the truth about how much their scope and rope operation costs. The U.S. Government Accountability Office released a letter to Transportation Committee Chairman John Micah that confirms the Transportation Security Administration has used faulty data and withheld information when evaluating and comparing the costs of all federal screening models and an alternative federal private screening program. The GAO caught them in another bulk based lie. They even fibbed about their dismal 70% failure rate to detect weapons and were busted for that. So should we trust their health claims? After all, the TSA reported that their scanners were approved by the FDA. Now, there's only one small problem with that, and that's that the FDA spokesman told AOL News that, quote, despite TSA claims to the contrary, it has no role in testing the machines or inspecting the manufacturer. They couldn't even do it if they wanted to, since the machines aren't medical devices. Since the machines aren't medical devices, they're outside of the FDA's legal authority. So, oops, <laughs> the FDA caught them in another line. In addition to the FDA, the U.S. Army Public Health Command the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and the Health Physics Society all quickly backed away from the TSA's assertions that they had somehow signed off on the safety of these machines, according to this AOL report. Scientists began raising the alarms about the TSA's health claims last spring. A group of physicists from the University of California wrote to the President's Science and Technology Advisor about the potential serious health risks and total lack of independent testing. With the, with the TSA constantly alleging that the machines are safe, the scientists said an impartial panel of experts that would include medical physicists and radiation biologists should review all the available relevant data. Of course, the TSA can't allow an independent review because that would supposedly tip off the tariffs. So we just have to consider their reputation for honesty when we evaluate their claims actually have some small amount of sympathy for the TSA thugs. After all, many may end up dying of cancer from radiation exposure. I understand that morale is a constant problem. Why wouldn't it be? Regularly express to them their feelings of utter contempt. If there are any good people in those jobs, they should walk away now. No paycheck is worth it. At this point, the one remaining seems to be the, seem to be the type of people that crave power, and have no respect for fellow human beings. We've all heard about the rampant theft from travelers. And I mean, do you think for a second, even a tiny fraction of the criminals have been caught or exposed? The TSA only admits so far to firing about 500 agents for ripping off travelers. 
At JFK, they started an investigation and caught agents taking $40,000 on the very first day of the program. These crooks later admitted to taking another $160,000. The TSA supervisor was in on the scam and was taking bribes to keep it going. The worst examples of the TSA mentality are the child rapists. In Orlando, a 57-year-old TSA employee, Charles Bennett, was arrested for allegedly having sexual contact with a 12-year-old girl. The pervert admits to asking the girl to be his sex slave, grabbing the girl's breasts and soliciting the young girl for sex. On his MySpace page, he calls himself Master Charles and says he's into submissive females and a master of bondage, dominance, sadism, and masochism. Unfortunately, Bennett was not the first TA agent arrested for child rape. The TSA has created an ideal job for these molesters and con artists, yet we're expected to trust them with naked pictures of our family and let them feel up our loved ones. We're supposed to trust them with airline security? Well, not a chance in hell. Just this month, at least three TSA agents and two police officers were arrested for their participation in a large oxycodone smuggling ring, smuggling ring that operated between Connecticut and Florida. This January, an arms dealer regularly loaded disassembled semiotic weapons in his luggage and flew them to the United Kingdom. According to UK police, the guns were sold to criminal gangs. His 9mm Glocks were purchased at gun shows and sold for as much as $8,000. And as many as 60 guns may have been smuggled on commercial flights with the help of the TSA. In March, a TSA agent was arrested for helping a drug smuggler pass through security at the Buffalo Niagara International Airport. Behavioral detection officer Minetta Walker was a nine-year TSA employee trained to detect and analyze human behavior. Walker had unrestricted access to the airport and its security stations. She's, she's accused of using her access to allow a drug dealer to pass through security using an alias and moving him away from security lines and through airport gates without inspection. Locally, in March, TSA officer Thomas Gordon Jr., a passenger screener at Philadelphia International Airport, was arrested for distributing child pornography. In May, TSA officer Rynell B. De La Cruz was arrested at Orlando International Airport for attempted gun smuggling. Radio host Laura Ingram even got her baptismal cross heisted. She says it was blessed by the Pope but that didn't protect it from the sticky-fingered TSA screener. In July, in Fort Lauderdale, TSA officer Nelson Santiago Serrano was arrested for multiple counts of grand theft after allegedly stealing $50,000 worth of electronics from passengers' luggage and selling them. A Continental Airlines employee caught him shoving an iPod in his pants, an iPad in his pants. Now, these are just a few of the numerous scandals. I could go on and on. Tens of thousands of TSA thefts are reported every year. Just this week, a high-ranking TSA official was charged with murder in Mississippi. The culture of corruption is obvious. So now that we have an understanding of the integrity level that we're dealing with at the TSA from top to bottom, what's the big deal? Well, consider for a second that if someone was intent on causing harm to a plane, how hard would it be to bribe or blackmail one of these crooks? How hard would it be to get one of these people to sneak on an unscreened bag? While Granny is getting felt up and the blue shirts ogle of pictures of your daughter in the back room, the real bad guy has endless opportunities to board a plane unmolested. While they confiscate your hair products and suspicious breast milk, an actual villain can easily buy unscreened access to your plane for his payload. The TSA is not only failing to provide any meaningful security service, they have created a gaping security hole by pushing out private, well-screened, well-monitored security personnel. So this is the talking point that I really want us to drive home. 
These aren't just bumbling bureaucrats and keystone cops. The TSA is riddled with child rapists, thieves, and scumbags. Luckily, the statistical chance of terrorism is minuscule, but considering the U.S. government's continuing interventions around the world, it could just be a matter of time before someone decides to capitalize on the TSA's created vulnerability. So now the TSA is pushing back against our resistance. Despite the scandals and widespread ridicule from the public, the TSA unfortunately isn't considering packing up and going home. They've been digging in their heels and spreading their tentacles into other modes of transportation, sporting events like football games and NASCAR races and even school proms. It's been interesting watching how they respond to various legislative, legal, and PR challenges. The TSA would like you to think that they are responding to criticism. Recently, they announced that they are reconsidering procedures for their victims under age 13. Big Sis Napolitano says the kids might not have to take off their shoes, as if that's the problem with child screenings, not the new pictures of the feel-ups or the diaper checks. They're certainly more willing to respond to the complaints with even more invasive tactics. Their new trusted traveler program, or as I call it, the pre-abused traveler program, aims to screen, streamline the screening process for those willing to submit to a full background check. Employment verification, credit check, biometric cataloging, they might even check your Facebook friends. If you get their internal passport, you might not get date raped. A lot of people have used Israel's passenger profiling as an example of a more productive security measure. So the TSA has introduced their own chat down where TSA agents will interview their victims to look for signs of belligerence. After the test at Logan International caused a four-hour security backup, the TSA said that they were pleased with how the pilot program has gone. They were recently forced to pull out all the stops to block the passage of some legislation in Texas that would have outlawed their abusive tactics. Despite 100% support in the Texas House, they were able to threaten and bribe enough of the Texas Senate and their executive branch to shut it down. State level legislative remedies may still be a possibility, but the system is rigged for the elites, not for the people. Texas has learned that the hard way. Others have tried lawsuits against the TSA agents. Some have earned settlements. The last thing the TSA wants is to have their authority challenged by judges and definitely not by juries. That brings us to H.R. 963, the See Something, Say Something Act of 2011. Now, if that doesn't have an ominous name, I don't know what does. To amend the Homeland Security Act of 2002 to provide immunity for reports of suspected terrorist activity or suspicious behavior and response. The bill provides legal immunity for all government agents and their snitches. It also attempts to stifle legal challenges to this immunity by allowing the government agent or snitch to recover costs and attorney fees from the plaintiff if the, if the judge upholds their immunity. So, if this bill passes, the TSA will gain total immunity for their assaults. And don't dare challenge it unless you're ready to pay through the nose if you lose. So, for, but for now, go ahead and sue the hell out while you can. But don't look for the courts to suddenly care about your interests or to defend the Constitution. That's just not what they're there for. The TSA is even fighting back aggressively against negative PR. Advice columnist Amy Alkin published the following personal account of her assault by TSA agent Fadala McGee. Quote, nearing the end of this violation, I sobbed even louder as the woman four times struck the side of her glove into my vagina, through my pants, between my labia, she really got up there four times, back, right, and left, and front, right, and left, in my vagina, between my labia. I was shocked, utterly unprepared for how she got the side of her hand up there. It was government-sanctioned sexual assault. Upon leaving, still sobbing, I yelled to the woman, you raped me. In return for sharing her date rape story, 
Ms. Alton was threatened with a $500,000 defamation suit if she didn't immediately take down the blog post. Clearly, the legislative and judicial systems are rigged for their use, not for ours. So we need a different approach, an agorist approach, an entrepreneurial approach. So that brings us to the we won't fly strategy. While others have focused on political solutions, new legislation and lobbying efforts, the tactic advocated by we won't fly is surprisingly enough to not fly. Avoid the airports, opt out of everything the TSA does. Protect yourself and your family from radiation and potential sexual assault. This is a strategy that was first suggested by Michael Roberts, the courageous pilot who walked off the job rather than submit to a humiliating scan or groping. The idea is to show the industry that we won't buy their services if it means we're going to get abused. By targeting the travel industry's profits, we hope to win their lobbying power. I don't expect politicians to listen to you or me, but they do listen to big money. So is the strategy working? Our Facebook page has endless comments from folks who are choosing not to fly. We get loads of comments like these. Lydia says, I still have people rolling their eyes when I say I refuse to fly commercial. Let them roll their eyes. I'm not getting on a commercial flight unless I'm unconscious or dead when they put me on it. We get posts like that every day, literally hundreds of them. Um, evidently, there's more than just anecdotal information that non-flyers are having an impact. The, USA, the U.S. Travel Association estimates that the travel industry is losing $85 million per year due to the TSA's abusive security theater. So is that significant? Um, I think it is, but the airlines are still thrilled to offload their security costs and liability onto the backs of taxpayers. They're not about to stand up and demand responsibility for their passenger safety, and they're not about to demand the abolishment of the TSA. So even though the TSA isn't about to go away, I think this report is still worth celebrating. That $85 million figure represents an emerging market for commercial air travel alternatives and entrepreneurial workarounds. We don't need to wait for politicians to make air travel a dignified experience again. As more and more people refuse to be abused, the incentives for innovation are increasing. In fact, right here, right now, we are all participating in the development of a significant TSA workaround. I believe that the very concept of an unconference is revolutionary. It could become a game changer in the conference and corporate meeting industry. An online interactive conference can replace many association meetings or the traditional need to fly in a thousand sales reps or regional managers for a big corporate meeting. Email, faxes, and FedEx have brought the post office monopoly to its needs. The market for alternatives to, to traditional air travel are just emerging. Look for the emergence of travel agents that specialize in arranging scan and growth free travel options using general aviation flights, cooperative plane sharing, and routing through TSA free airports. We're already seeing airlines advertise a TSA free experience. That $85 million is on the table right now. It's the price for agorists, it's the prize for agorists willing to build the solutions that we need. As that figure grows, so will our options. The TSA uses centralized aggression and coercion. We are decentralized and we cooperate voluntarily. We can leverage that strength to regain our freedom of travel. If the politicians and courts ever catch up with the public's need to fly with dignity, that's great, but they aren't the answer. They'll probably show up later and then claim that they were the ones that solved the problem. So be it. We need to step up our educational campaigns. The second annual National Opt-Out Day will be a great media opportunity, but the real work will be reaching folks right now before they get to the airport, before they even make a travel plan. So let's continue to build the ranks of educated travelers willing to stand up for their rights, and let's be ready to support the bold, and, and the bold innovators who are creating the alternatives that we need. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Agora's I.O. Unconference. Hey. Thank you. We are live from Valley Forge Beef and Ale in historic 
beautiful downtown Valley Forge. My name is Ken Crotcher. I will be your MC for today. We have over 100 exciting libertarian speakers as part of the Agora Unconference today. We're going to hear several of them here at the Valley Forge Beef and Ale today. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, and they include the ANCAP Entrepreneur Network, Center for a Stateless Society, Cockblock, Phoenix, excuse me, Freedom's Phoenix, Free Keen, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWillFly.com. Our next speaker will be Darren Wolf. Darren is a Philadelphia libertarian blogger and activist. His blog, The International Libertarian, is of course available on the web. Darren is the founder of Focus on Peace, a politically neutral peace movement. An interesting, unique idea. Focus on Peace is organizing the cross-philosophical, cross-political, anti-war peace fair. Darren is also involved with many other freedom projects, including principled non-voting. Welcome to the stage of the Valley Forge Beef and Ale, Darren Wolf. Well, thank you, Ken, and I would like to thank all of my fellow liberty-minded peace activists, both here and online. Of course, I need to thank, need to thank Jim for being so tall. There we go. Uh, I'd also like to thank George Donnelly for organizing the Agora I.O. This is great. Today I'm going to talk about the peace movement. Some of the things that it is doing right, many of the things that it is doing wrong, offer solutions, but also touch on some of the reasons why the United States is at war, or at least the reasons that are given and debunk them. Focus on Peace is an inclusive peace movement. It is one that people of all political persuasions can join in good conscience. The idea has been around for a while. Unfortunately, it has been all rhetoric until now. For example, the International Action Center, the IAC, had a conference last November. They named it the Regional Anti-War Conference and a National Meeting to Stop FBI Repression. They hailed it as a discussion of a new kind of unified and inclusive anti-war movement that can challenge the wars abroad and at home. As is usually the case with left-wing anti-war organizations, this one too comes with their social agenda as part of the package. On their website, they state that part of the discussion is to be about and I'm quoting here, a massive movement to bring the war dollars, troops, and mercenaries home now, rebuilding our cities, providing jobs, schools, and health care that we all have a right to, end quote. Bringing the troops and mercenaries home sounds great. It's the part about then using the money saved to finance government spending on social programs that is a problem for the liberty-minded. Given this reality, the question has to be asked, is this truly an inclusive anti-war movement? No doubt that by now progressive listeners are rolling their eyes wondering how this crazy libertarian could be against uh, spending money on health care and education. We're actually not. The problem is we oppose the government spending money on health care and education. Thank you. <laughs> the point is, though, this isn't the time or the place to engage in a debate about these subjects. We can do that later, after we end the wars. Now is the time to agree to disagree on some things and to unite to stop the wars and oppression. Woo. Libertarians are reaching out to the left to stand together for peace, sometimes with good results and sometimes with uh, not-so-good results, let's say. Let me touch on the not-so-good results first. Personally, I approached the organizers of the October 16th Peace Rally in Philadelphia last year at their planning meeting a few days before the event. I spoke to them not about making any changes for October 16th, that event was just a few days away, but for future rallies. I asked them if they would be willing to put aside some of their agenda to accommodate people of other points of view. Now there, I was... Uh, Politely but firmly told. Does anybody want to guess what I was told? Spanish. Shut up. 
<laughs> well, no, I was, it was polite. Uh, he, well, the, the joke was that I was told to sit down and shut up. <laughs> no, they were very polite. They said no. <clears throat> Earlier this year, there was a meeting in Philly, leading up to the big peace rally of April 9th in New York City. There, Joe Lombardo of the United National Anti-War Committee got up and specifically said that the anti-war movement cannot be politically neutral. He said it must take up causes like social justice, the environment, and the Palestinians in order to be effective. It does make me wonder what his definition of effective is. It doesn't seem to be doing that much yet. Then there was the Declare Peace Fair that was put on by the Brandywine Peace Community over the 4th of July weekend over by Independence Hall. There, one of the socialists stood in front of the Focus on Peace table directly, and I thought rather rudely, contradicting our message. He was saying something to the effect of no need to be apolitical, stand up for the unions and health care and all the rest. I want to be clear, I'm not criticizing the Brandywine Peace Community here. This is a somebody who had a table at the fair. I actually rather like working with the Brandywine Peace Community. They do keep their focus rather well. Lastly, there is a rather strange reference on the One People's Project website to uh, crackpot libertarians uh, latching on to the peace movement to advance their agenda. Hmm, it's a good thing the left doesn't do that. When the left tax on their social agenda to their anti-war coalitions that others cannot endorse, they tell us we're not welcome. We're not asking any of the organizations and individuals that are part of the IAC or similar organizations to change their advocacy. Their speakers can say all the same things they always have. Same with the signs they hold up. All we ask is that the anti-war coalitions themselves be politically neutral so we can all join them in good conscience. Well, enough of the bad news. Now for the good news. Fortunately, not everyone on the left is against unity. Many Greens, Naderites, and Progressive Democrats have said that they support the idea of a united peace movement. For example, uh, Veronica Nunn of Brooklyn for Peace wrote in an email, I looked at your website and I really like what the group is doing. There are quite a few people that are very turned off by the extreme left approach to peace. Joan Weil of Grandmothers Against the War wrote a reply to a comment that I made on a, an article she wrote. She stated her support for the Focus on Peace concept. I totally agree, Darren. I get so frustrated uh, when at a rally, for instance, speakers bring up unconnected, controversial issues that turn people off, who otherwise are dedicated to ending the wars. It's certainly a problem, and I'm appreciative that you brought it up. Also, Bob Small, a local Green Party leader, wrote on a mailing list. One of my leftist friends questioned how to bring in people from other political persuasions to the anti-war movement because they don't agree with us on other issues. My feeling is that that is why the anti-war movement has had 30 years of fragmentation, marginalization, and dissolution. The last March on Washington I attended featured 13 other issues, including a few I disagreed with. That was over five years ago. I decided they could stop the war without me. All of us who think that way need to come together. Now, there are obstacles to our working together. It's inevitable when you put people with different ideologies in the same room. But these, ob these obstacles can and must be overcome. One of the major obstacles that I have seen is people on the left saying that we need to work on the big picture to achieve peace. And that includes things such as social justice and economic justice. I certainly agree that there is a big picture. It's just not the one that the left is talking about. I'm going to go into a little bit of libertarianism here, not because I'm trying to push libertarianism on people who aren't libertarians. I just want to make sure that the non-libertarians who might be hearing me understand that we do have a big picture. It is intelligently considered, well thought out, and very fact-based. When the left decries the government's diversion of resources, from human needs to the military, it's on to something. War does impoverish us. But what the left needs to understand is that the government that has the resources to build schools has the resources to build drones. The government that has the resources to build roads has the resources to build jet fighters. And that government, with the power to tax 
and create money has the resources to <clears throat> has the resources to buy weapons and wage war. Make no mistake about it, wage war they will. For it's very much as the progressive uh, commentator from the early 20th century, Randolph Bourne, wrote, war is the health of the state. Giving the state resources only feeds the war machine. Welfare at home and warfare abroad are merely flip sides of the same coin. We cannot give the government the tools it needs to wage war and expect it not to do so. I'm not talking about weapons here. <clears throat> it's not enough that we advocate that they just not buy weapons. We have to take away the tools that they use to acquire them. That means we have to do a few things. One of them would be ending the Federal Reserve System, ending the income tax, ending the federal government's social spending, its regulatory role, and its police powers. Peace will only come when the government is powerless to commit evil acts both abroad and at home. That's a libertarian view. I'm not saying that everybody has to agree with us to stand with us against the wars. Far from it. We welcome people of other points of view. All we ask is the same consideration in return. Imagine the strength of a truly united and inclusive peace movement. We can do it. All it takes is a little tolerance and understanding. Speaking of tolerance and understanding reminds me of the organization that I'm here representing, Focus on Peace. The few words. Our purpose is to have a peace movement that welcomes people of all ideologies, creeds, and beliefs. One that makes everyone feel not only comfortable, but a part of the movement. No one should feel that they are stand they're endorsing someone else's political agenda standing up for peace. To this end, we have one focus, ending the wars abroad. Now that the summer is over, we need to get back to work on this. We're going to be starting up our very popular sine waves again. But more important, as uh, Ken mentioned earlier, we're organizing what will hopefully be the first of the annual Philadelphia Peace Fairs. This will be modeled on the annual Brooklyn Peace Fair. There will be exhibitors, tables, workshops, and well-known speakers. The date is set for Saturday, uh, April 7th of next year at the Friends Meeting House at 4th and Arch Street in Philadelphia. This is one you don't want to miss. It's going to be great. If you or your group would like to participate, you can uh, rent a table, place an ad in the program. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me about this. There is another group that uh, deserves mention here, and that is Come Home America, and their website is comehomeamerica.us. The basis of this group is a book, the book entitled Come Home America. This is a compilation of essays uh, written by participants in a conference that happened in February of last year. They describe themselves as unlike-minded people. What that unites them is their concern about the militarism that is taking over the country, and of course the wars abroad. People at this conference were left, right, center, libertarians, liberals, progressives, conservatives. What they were trying to do was reflect views, uh, the views of many Americans not represented in the uh, political dialogue in Congress, the White House, or the mainstream media. This group, too, deserves your support. At this point, let me uh, open up the floor to some questions, if anybody has any. Or if anybody is putting up any questions above me where I can't see. Anybody? Oh, okay. Uh, when is the Philadelphia Peace Fair? And the question it was, when is the Phil when is the Philadelphia Peace Fair? It's Saturday, April seventh. In Philadelphia, of course. Any other questions? Okay, let me carry on. Let me touch now on some of the mainstream views or reasons, I should say, of why the US needs to intervene overseas. The idea that the U.S. is fighting defensively overseas to keep the Muslim hordes from taking us over and implement Sharia law, this idea doesn't even pass the laugh test. The idea that we're promoting democracy is made an obvious lie by just looking at the dictatorships, past and present, that the United States supports and has supported. 
let's put aside the, the media clowns. We'll put aside the, the babbling, scaremongering politicians. The more serious reason to intervene around the world is the protection of international trade. The argument is that since the United States is so dependent on global trade, we have to control the seas to ensure our continued prosperity. If we don't control the seas, another power that does might cut us off from our overseas markets and suppliers, badly hurting our economy. Certainly, there is some logic to this argument. Now, one advocate of this view is George Friedman. He is the founder and CEO of Strat4, which stands for Strategic Forecasting. It's a private global intelligence company giving non-ideological analysis. And he wrote a great book earlier this year titled The Next Decade. It talks about geopolitical realities in the world and projects forward 10 years. Now, while I cannot agree with Mr. Friedman's pro-intervention conclusions, he does make very good points that few Americans are willing to face. I'm going to put it down. I don't, want to, I don't want to promote his book too much. One of the major points that he makes is that the United States has become an unintended empire. This is important to bear in mind when talking about controlling the shipping lanes around the world. The great empires have always been about trade as much as they've been about military control, sometimes more so. And we're no different. Let me get back to debunking the pro-empire uh, pro trade argument here. Every benefit must be balanced against its cost. And the cost of maintaining an empire goes well beyond just the government's defense budget, State Department budget, foreign aid budget, UN budget, World Bank budget, International Monetary Fund budget. Well, I could go on, but I'm sure you guys get the idea. We are talking about some huge costs here that are greatly slowing our economy, not stimulating it as some claim. Taking our cues from the wisdom of the French classical liberal economist Frederick Bastiat, who in his essay, wrote, uh, who wrote an essay, which is that which is seen and that which is not seen, he tells us that we have to look deeper than just the obvious that is right in front of our noses. The benefits of empire would seem to be the trade and the relative prosperity we've enjoyed, at least until this recession started. Should I say end the Fed now? <laughs> the cost of empire is also in what is not produced because of the kind of government it imposes and the economic and social policies such a government implements. Earlier I touched on how welfare and warfare go hand in hand. To get the populace to tolerate the cost of empire and support the government, these costs must be hidden and the people must be bought off by means of a welfare state. Let me add to that, the regulatory state, where the government pretends to be protecting people. What it's really doing is something else. Intervention abroad requires intervention domestically. In order to be strong enough to project power overseas, the government has to tighten its grip domestically, if only to acquire the resources it needs to do so. And this causes many harms in the process. I'm talking about how taxes, regulation, and welfare drain the economy and severely limit growth. Just one example, Social Security is conservatively estimated to cost us 5% GDP growth every year. Think about that. 5% compounded annually means you double your capital every 14 years. Now, Social Security has been around for a long time, but if we go back 28 years, by that math, we're living at about a quarter of the standard of living we should have. Taxes and regulations only add to the destruction of our wealth. When anyone says that losing our overseas markets would make us poorer, and that's why we need an empire, the answer is to say, well, the empire has already impoverished us. I think I would rather take a chance on freedom, peace, the free market. <clears throat> I haven't even touched on the destruction of our civil liberties under the kind of militarist democracy we have. We just heard about the Transportation Security Administration and how it's trampling our rights. Soon, we're going to hear a talk about how the U.S. has become a police state, and there will be another talk about opposing curfews. 
And when Mark and Rose gets up on this stage, hang on to your hat. <laughs> so I'm not going to belabor the point about civil liberties myself. It's been covered, it's been covered, and it will be covered by others. Suffice it to say that uh, what seems obvious to us in the liberty movement isn't always obvious to the rest. One argument I hear a lot is that we are way free compared to the people that lived in uh, Nazi Germany. That's a dictatorship. That's not what we have here. We're free. Everything is okay here. Not perfect, but okay. Well, that's the argument. I disagree. We may not be suffering as much as the unfortunate people who lived under Hitler's government, but that does not mean we have the liberties we should have either. <clears throat> the process uh, is an old one. And unfortunately, while it should be obvious, it's not obvious to many people. What I'm talking about is that the illusion of liberty has to be maintained. Thomas Paine warned us about this back in 1795 in his uh, most famous book, The Rights of Man. Here are his words. The portion of liberty enjoyed in England is just enough to enslave a country more productively than by despotism. And that as the real object of all despotism is revenue, a, governor, a government so formed obtains more than it could do either by direct despotism or in a full state of freedom, and is therefore on the ground of interest opposed to both. They account also for the readiness which always appears in such governments for engaging in war by remarking on the different motives which produced them. In despotic governments, wars are the effect of pride, but in those governments in which they become the means of taxation, they acquire, thereby, a more permanent promptitude. So we have war for tax and tax for war. <clears throat> One reason I decided to stop thinking on the left and focus on the mainstream is that we need to expand the peace movement. It, it remains a matter of the radical left on one side and the libertarians on another. It'll keep getting the same dismal result it has up until now. In between, is the two, in between the two sides is the great middle, the famous Joe and Jane six-pack. They're not radicals. They might be Democrats, they might be Republicans, they might be independents. They may also be anti-war, but where have they been able to turn? Well, until now, we've left them out of the peace movement. Now, though, with groups like Focus on Peace, they have a place to go to engage in peace activism. Any questions? I asked if you had any questions. Okay, let me continue. I'd like to get back to uh, debunking some ideas about the United States and the Empire. And that means getting back to my favorite intellectual that I like to debunk, George Friedman. Also in the next decade, he states that he passionately wants the American Republic to survive the empire it has acquired. Long live the unintended empire. That means the Republic is dead, though. <clears throat> he rightly points out that the Roman Republic was overwhelmed by its empire and doesn't want to see that happen here. Unfortunately, it has already happened. We're not about to uh, see a, an emperor crowned a la Julius Caesar. That's not going to happen in the United States in the 21st century. But the form of the republic lives on long after the reality of it has died. Patrick Henry told us long ago that we can't be a republic and an empire at the same time. Back in 1788, arguing against adoption of the Constitution, he wrote a speech that he prophetically entitled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? This is what he said. But now, sir, the American spirit, assisted by the ropes and chains of consolidation, is about to convert this country into a powerful and mighty empire. Such a government is incompatible with the genius of republicanism. There will be no checks, no real balances in this government. What can avail your specious imaginary balances, your rope-dancing, chain-rattling, ridiculous ideal checks and contrivances? But sir, we are not feared by foreigners. We do not make nations tremble. Would this constitute happiness or secure liberty? That's end quote. I would say the answer to his question is no. Today the world trembles before the American government's might. 
This includes many Americans themselves who are increasingly victimized by it. Patrick Henry's prophetic words come back to haunt us. I know where I stand when it comes to the question of shall liberty or empire be sought. I say liberty always and forever. Anyone else here feel that way? Yeah! yeah. Right. Whether you're on the left or the right, join us in standing for liberty by standing with us against the greatest destroyers that there are of it, war and empire. So you can check out our website, very subtly displayed here, fopeace.com. You can see what we're doing there. Uh, those of you who are here can sign up for email updates, too. How am I doing on time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, any questions? Yes. So uh, when uh, the Arab Spring has reached uh, Syria and Yemen, there, you know, the, the, the army are, have opened fire on their own people and slaughtering their own people. When the Arab Spring has reached um, Libya, then the Libyan army turned against its own people and NATO came in. And they, one of the things that happened was the sovereign wealth fund of Libya was, was taken. Um, do you know who took that and what that whole thing is about? Uh, that's not the direction I expected your question to go in. Uh, the question was about a sovereign wealth fund in Libya and right. who took it and where it went. Uh, I'll, I'll answer your question very honestly. No, I'm not aware of uh, who took it and where it went. Um, it seems like it's pretty normal when governments and the leaders of governments start running that they, um, well, I guess in days gone by, it would have been suitcases full of money that they take with them. Maybe today they do electronic money transfers. But no. Uh, what I was going to say, though, if I can kind of answer not your question, but something related to that, um, why was there intervention in uh, Li Libya, maybe, and not Syria? I think the answer is obvious, that there's no principles involved in the intervention. It's all a what the United States sees as uh, practical. Um, they don't care about Syria. Perhaps they care about the oil in Libya. Therefore, Libya gets different treatment than Syria. Any other questions? Uh, okay, let me thank. <laughs> let me thank some of the people that brought uh, the, uh, the event to us. The ANCAP Entrepreneur Network, these are our sponsors. Center for Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedom is Phoenix. Free Keen, Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWon'tFly.com. So thank you. And I guess I'm not a Vulcan. Theory. 
So, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Krawchuk and his speech, Anarchy, Then What? Let's have a big hand. Thank you, Jared. Let's talk about anarchy. I'm no anarchist. Let me start off right with that. But, I'm not a statist either. What I'd like to talk about today is a middle ground between anarchy and status. As it turns out, there's room there. Room for what I call an agoran state. Oxymoronic though the concept may, may seem. You know, I'm not a status now, but I used to be a status. Back in the 60s and 70s, I fought against the state as well. I marched against the war in Vietnam, mainly because I didn't want to get drafted. Remember the draft? Also, because it was a great way to meet women. It's a good way to be out there. In the end, because of our protests, we managed to end that war. We managed to end the draft. And we got rid of Richard Nixon. Afterwards, I folded up my sign, went home, got married, raised a family. I spent 20 years as a registered Democrat. Talk about being a statist. I used to believe that I could use your means for my ends. Other than that, I minded my own business, at least until I started my own business in 1988. Now that was a real eye-opener, believe me, because I found out just how pervasive the state really was. Turned out that I found that there were others who wanted to use my means for their ends. Turns out there was endless paperwork. I would receive notices of subjectivity. You've got to pay this tax. You've got to file that form. I could get permits. Turned out that my business was illegal, an IT business, illegal in the state of New Jersey, even though my largest customer was in New Jersey. That was a real challenge. And then through the letters from the IRS, they made a mistake. They say, Ken, you owe $64,000. Once did my heart stop for that. After that, you just get used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another mistake. But having opened my own business, having run it, I figured there has to be a better way. This just doesn't work. So I started looking around, and at the age of 35, for the first time in my life, I read the United States Constitution. Now that was another eye-opener, because I read it, and I found they're not following it. No big surprise. I'm a reminder of the Spooner quote. Either the Constitution has granted the sort of government we have today, or it's been powerless to stop it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. It's true. So there I was, 1988. I figured I'm going to start looking around for a solution. So I got together a couple of friends. We held what we called constitutional conventions. And I noticed that David Eastley's in the audience. He was one of the people who was there for that. And we started discussing what could we do instead. First there were a couple of us, then five of us, then ten of us, then twenty of us, and they kept growing over the months. And we made some real progress. For example, we, kept, we came to the conclusion that money is actually debt. It's probably one of the most important things we found out. Now remember, this is 1988. There was no internet. There was no way of getting the word out. We were discovering these things on our own, one after the other. We are discovering all sorts of things until one day, somebody invited an anarchist. Now that was not an eye-opener, but let me tell you, it was a door-opener. Because what that anarchist did is he introduced us to the whole world of activists that were still out there. Unlike me, who folded up my signs and went home and raised a family, they were still out there. Who has ever heard of Fact Sheet 5? No one's heard of Fact Sheet 5. It, oh, of course, David has. He was there in the beginning. Fact Sheet 5 is a bibliography of, called an amateur magazines on any topic. Now, back in the day, before the internet, anytime you had an online forum, it was offline. They were always printed. So what I did is I joined one of these, uh, what do they call APAs, one of these magazines. It was called The Connection. It was where anarchists would go to talk about issues. Eventually that led me to libertarianism, so I came into libertarianism through anarchy, unusual runaround. But I spent several years corresponding with anarchists, a lot of anarchists, some famous anarchists, including Robert Anton Wilson, Bob Shea, Irvin Strauss, Fed Bulberry, Dirk Pearson, Sandy Shaw, a whole bunch of them. 
And you know what I found out? I found out they couldn't tell me what anarchy really is. Now, they all agreed that anarchy was the absence of a state. And they all agreed that once the state was gone, people would decide for themselves what kind of organization they would want. But what would they want? They couldn't say. All they could say is, it wouldn't be your way. It wouldn't be my way. It would be some way. Based on that, I come up with an interesting revelation. That anarchy really can't last. Anarchy is like a bouncing ball. As you reduce the amount of government to zero, it has to bounce back again. Anarchy is a very quick, fleeting, transitory thing. Because the minute you have two people together, you need some sort of a rule between them. Suppose I believe might make right, might makes right, and you don't. You have to come up with some sort of a rule. If we have a room full of people, we have to come up with a, a rule. Who's going to cover all your checks? Who's going to buy your beer? The minute you go to zero, you have to bounce back. You have to come back with some rules. Maybe they'll be your rules. Maybe they'll be my rules. But there'll be some rules. So the question becomes, and the title of my talk today, after anarchy, then what? Most of us agree that we don't want what we have today. We have institutionalized theft, taxation. We have institutionalized force, the court system. We have institutionalized so socialism, the welfare state. But assuming we come back from zero government, in which direction do we want to bounce it? What do we replace our government with? That question and a lot more is answered in my upcoming novel, Atlas Snug, a copy of which I forgot to bring with me to hold up, use your imagination, atlassnug.com. The process of figuring out what to do is a short one. We must separate society and state. And once you split them, we must remove the immoral parts. We should figure out what that looks like. Let's look at these pieces one at a time, society and state. I'll start with society because it's a lot less contentious. We've known for a long time that if you mix society and state, the results are disastrous. In fact, back in 1828, that famous American Davy Crockett made that very observation. And let me quote him. He said, the power of collecting and dispersing money at pleasure is the most dangerous power that can be entrusted to man particularly under our system of collecting revenue by a tariff. Because if you have the right to give to one, you have the right to give to all. As the Constitution neither defines charity nor stipulates the amount, you are therefore at liberty to give to any and anything and everything that you may believe or profess to believe is a charity, and in any amount you may think proper. We will very easily perceive what a wide door this would open for fraud, and corruption and favoritism on one hand, and for robbing people on the other. Did I just describe the America of today? Almost 200 years ago, Davy Crockett warned us of what we have now. Very prophetic. But the question remains, what do we do? Well, did you hear? Davy Crockett just told us. In that first sentence, he said, the power of collecting and dispersing money at pleasure is the most dangerous power that can be entrusted to man particularly under our system of collecting revenue by a tariff. There's the solution. It's obvious. What I'm proposing, and one of the key points of my novel, is the implementation of Crockett's warning. We don't entrust the distribution of charity onto a system of collecting revenue by tariff. We do it without that. We must separate the needs of charity from the needs of the state. The way it is right now, the state takes care of all of our charity. We've got Social Security, we've got Medicare, we've got the welfare state, food stamps, we've got tons and tons of socialistic programs, all at the taxpayer expense. But if you couple the insatiable demand of charity with the power to compel payment through taxation, you're guaranteeing your own destruction. It's like connecting a tank of oxygen to vacuum. The oxygen will be gone, and you can wind up looking for something to breathe. In my opinion, the solution is that we play Solomon and we let them be divided. Divide state and society. Separate the two like we do religion and state. How? Let me throw out a simple straw man here. 
since government can't be entrusted to administer charity, let's set up a separate organization. Call it society. You know, a bit of originality, right? An illimosinist organization, for those of you, those of you the legal pen. And let's, for example, use the United States Constitution as its framework. So that means there'd be a, an executive branch, judicial, judicial branch, legislative branch, president, but there'd be one crucial difference. First one, two, <laughs> is we would eliminate the power of coercive taxation. Society would have to run exclusively on voluntary contributions. I wouldn't call it taxation, I'd come up with the word benefaction. It's probably the best word for it because it is completely voluntary. To recognize that in the Constitution, I would pull out Article 1, Section 8, which has the 17 enumerated powers of the government. And instead, I would replace it with two simple powers. Number one, society's Congress shall have the power to make voluntary guidelines regarding requesting donations and making expenditures towards the common good and the good of others. Second, society shall have the power to set voluntary guidelines for the conduct of business and other affairs of men. The way it works, states now pass mandatory laws, society would pass voluntary guidelines. Let me get into those powers just a little bit, give you an idea of how they would be implemented. First, society's Congress shall have the power to make voluntary guidelines requesting donations, regarding the requesting of donations and making expenditures toward the common good and the good of others. As I said, the states collect taxes, society will collect these voluntary benefactions. No pressure at all. If you want to contribute, fine. If you don't, don't. The only pressure would be social pressure. So society would draw a budget. It would project what sort of charity needs. Food for the hungry, homes for the homeless, some kind of a stipend for the seniors, whatever it may be. And then it would collect from people whatever they chose to give. And whatever they gave, society would have to make do with that, period. They could have telethons, bake sales, whatever it may be, whatever it takes. That's all they would have to spend. That would take care of society's needs, especially for the unfortunate. Second rule, society shall have the power to set voluntary guidelines for the conduct of business and other affairs of men. You think of that as an underwriter's laboratory for society. So what would they do? They would define decent regulations. For example, the cleanliness of restaurants, the metal content in coins, the building codes, all sorts of things, all the worthwhile regulations we have today. But the key difference would be voluntary. You follow them or not. If you follow them, you run a business and follow them, people will have more faith in you as a business. Saying, oh, this is down the Ford's Beef and Ale. I know they have a clean kitchen here. They're, they follow society's guidelines and they advertise that fact. I'm more willing to come here. But they dive up the street, they don't follow society's guidelines, they don't advertise it. You want to go to the dive? You're more than welcome to. That's freedom, isn't it? But if the dive up the corner says, oh, we follow society's guidelines, but they don't. That's fraud. They're violating the law. And we can move against them. It's crime. So that's it. That's society's constitution. That is the social contract that you've always heard about. Completely voluntary. Because having signed it, you're not held to it. You could still do as you want. And the best part is, since all contributions are voluntary, it avoids all the pitfalls that David Crockett warned us of. It gives us a disciplined vehicle for taking care of society's needs, but not for the scoundrel to steal from us. Now, you can't eliminate scoundrels entirely, but it certainly limits the amount of damage they can do. So that takes care of society. What about the state? Now, we've just done, done away with institutionalized socialism. Now it's part of society. It's now all voluntary. And the taxes that used to pay for that which, by the way, is more than half of the federal budget, so we've already cleared away that. So now we need to deal with the institutionalized force, which is the courts and the rest of the taxation. So before we can say what it is we're going to do with the state, we have to ask, what is the purpose of a state? Well, speaking as a libertarian, my opinion is it's there to defend the rights, lives, and property of the citizens. 
And a moral state, an agorist state, can only do that in one way. And that is by deriving its just powers directly from the consent of the people. The people don't have a certain right or power. Obviously, they cannot delegate that to their government. I don't have the right to steal. I cannot delegate to the government the right to levy taxes. You get the idea. But of course, governments now routinely violate the force. They initiate the use of force, left and right. Pay up. Look at that, the poor Art Parker. I'm sorry he's not here today. Where did the government get the power to initiate force? Certainly they didn't get it from us. We can't give it to the government. Strangely enough, though, we did give the government the power to initiate the use of force. The root of the problem is that we gave the government the ability, the monopoly on the use of defensive force. That goes all the way back to John Locke and his second treatise on government. John Locke was the one who proposed giving a monopoly to government on the use of defensive force. Sections 88 and 89, let me quote from them. Every man entered into society has therefore quitted his power to punish offenses. This puts men out of the state of nature and into that of a commonwealth by setting up a judge on earth with the authority to determine all the controversies and redress the injuries that may happen to any member of the commonwealth. So that's where it happened. We gave the government a monopoly on the use of defensive force. Question for the class, how does one maintain a monopoly? Force. By force. So by giving them the, the monopoly, they have introduced into government the ability to use force. And once they use it for one thing, you can bet your bottom dollar they're going to use it for a lot of, a lot of other things. And isn't that what happened to us now? When we surrendered our right to use defensive force, when we gave them monopoly, we delivered ourselves directly into the hands of force. So what's the solution? The solution is obvious. Don't surrender your right to use defensive force. Don't give them monopoly to the government, because what you're doing is you're opening the floodgates. You shouldn't allow the government any power that the individual citizens themselves do not possess. So with that, we now have the basis of a moral state. Call it an agorist state. Now, what would the agorist state do? What would you have it do? What, would you, what would, you, would you pass on rights that you have to an agorist state? First of all, I would put to you that we need a common rule. As I mentioned before, we'll have Darren pay for all of our food. I can see he's eating. You can buy my beer later on. You're lucky. But we need a common rule, one that we all agree on. Because if we didn't have a common rule, well, geez, there'd be anarchy, wouldn't there? And we don't want anarchy. And certainly we don't want the state. We want to navigate between the two of those things. So what I want to do is I'm going to keep this simple. This is, I only have half hour total here. So I want to start with a simple example. Let's assume, for example, we're at the bounce of the ball, right when it hits the table. The government's gone, and now the ball is coming up. In which direction are we going to bounce that ball? Let's say the ball moved to an empty town. Let's call it the empty state project, where it's just us and we've all moved in. And we all buy into one idea, the idea of a guards, of course. That means we begin with the idea of self-ownership, and therefore, by extension, property rights. We believe that it must be voluntary. It must be mutual. It must be intellectually free. It must be economically free. An agora society. I give you, I could sum that up in one sentence, and this is one of the campaign mantras of my governor campaign in 2002, you have the inalienable right to live your life your way without government interference, provided only that you respect the rights and property of others. Let me say it again. You have the inalienable right to live your life your way without interference, provided only that you respect the rights and property of others. That's it. Right away, a contradiction comes to mind. How do you enforce that in, a, in an area 
where there's no enforcement, where you can't force people to do something. Well, let's start with a government that strips down, we're, an existing government, but will strip away all the powers one by one until we're left with an agorist government. So let's start off with our own government. If we only have one rule, your life, your way, why do we need a legislative branch to pass more laws? We don't. So the legislative branch, gone. Since we don't have a legislative branch and there are no other laws, we don't need an executive branch to execute the orders. President, executive branch, gone. So you see, we've just gotten rid of two-thirds of our, of our government. But we still have a rule. Your life, your way, as long as you respect the rights of others. So that means there will still be bad guys who are going to break that rule, which means we need a court system. Now, what would that agoring court, court system look like? Well, it's easy to guess. It would be mutual. That means always, in every case, trial by jury. Jury be randomly selected from the people who happen to be in the audience that day for the court. Now, that would encourage participation in the court system because you're not going to let some bad guy stack the audience with his own supporters. You're going to have honest people there, even professional jurors. They'd be randomly selected. The judge himself would be no judge, or herself. The judge would only be a referee to make sure that things are being done. The jury would be the decision makers. Be mutual. Second one, it would be voluntary. Any sentence handed down by the jury would not be mandatory. The person accused and convicted would have the option of accepting the sentence or not. If they don't accept, well, they accept the sentence, that's fine. They're now they're reintegrated in society and the sentence is fulfilled. But if they don't, they are therefore outside the law, literally an outlaw. Since they reject the court system, they cannot use the court system to come to their own aid. It would be hypocrisy if they did. So therefore, they be treated as an invader because they just don't respect the rule that everyone else lives by. Since they're an invader, an outlaw, that means that anyone could do anything to them and they would have no redress through the court system. They better get out of town. Hightail it out of town lest by sunset they find themselves in a whole heap of trouble. Mutual, voluntary, free. Freedom means anybody can create a court. Now, of course, you have to give proper notice so you're not looking like you're doing a kangaroo court. So you would hold your own court. You could have just a general court where you hear just general crimes or a specialized court where you would do contract or you would do information technology or you would do biotechnology or something like that. You could set up your own court and you would have a reputation for how well you ran it. So there it is. That's our Goran state. One rule, your life, your way. Oops. Provide you respect the rights and property of others. One branch of government, courts, and anybody could set up the courts, even the mafia. A separate society to care for those who may have claim upon society because of their misfortune. A separate society, a separate Agoran state, a moral state, an Agoran state. I know we still have about five minutes left. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, Jen. Well, if everything is voluntary, what is it that actually makes your vision a state? I mean, is, is there any monopoly on force of any kind? No. As I said, we all buy into one rule, the Ivan, the Agora rule. Your life is yours. Your property is yours. You have the inalienable right to live your life your way without interference, provided only to respect the rights and property of others. What in, the, in, the, in the example, it doesn't make it a state. In the example I gave, we had the empty state project. We moved into the middle of the desert, maybe on an island in the middle of nowhere, like Sealand or on a floating platform someplace, and we just started doing this. And those people who moved in agreed to that. Now, I don't know that I would call it a state. State's a bad word for it. I would call it an Agoran state, just to differentiate it from the use of force states that we know and love, know and hate. Why wouldn't that be considered anarchy if there's no it's, monopoly on force? It's, it's not an anarchy because do what thou wilt is not the whole of the law. The whole of law is your life, your way, as long as you respect that right in others. Anarchy is when this ball is sitting on the table, Jim. When it's up here, we're at the government we have now. We hit zero and we come back up. And it only goes up a little bit. 
Just enough to say, your life, your way. He's quiet. I don't believe it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Karen. Whatever. Uh, I'd just like to suggest I think you're confusing anarchy with chaos. And they have two very different meanings. I, I'm not confusing anarchy with chaos. I'm using the definition, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I don't, I'm not necessarily calling that chaos. I don't know how that would turn out. And all the anarchists I corresponded with couldn't tell me either. We'll see what happens when we reach anarchy. How will the ball bounce back? I don't know. It could bounce back into chaos. You're correct. But it doesn't, it need not bounce back into chaos. Sure. Yeah, I would just say that anarchism, though, it, it advocates um, principles and guidelines. It's, it's not, I, I'd say that it can be used in two contexts where it's a state, it's a transitory state post governmental or body collapse. And that, that's why that you're using the term that it's a transitory state. But also, yep. it is an ideology as well where he, it's a notion that people, um, can function using guidelines and principles as opposed to force of governmental structure. So I think it's Correct. important to differentiate the two. Correct. Correct. That's similar to the question yeah. Darren just asked, because there are several ways that you can go to yeah. after anarchy. Yeah. And uh, the common perception of the word anarchy is the bomb throwing guy with black shirt on and everything. One thing that I really enjoy is that we've gotten away from the word anarchy. Now we have agora, which does that exact yeah, differentiation you're talking curd. about. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like bean curd. Nobody yeah. used to like to eat bean curd, but now they call it tofu. Tofu's cool. So it's the same thing. There's anarchy and there's the organization. The, 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 the problem is organization, but the way that organization is implemented and the principle of using it. Exactly. Yeah. And the principle that I'm picking on here, or choosing, is your life, your way. Yeah, and I have an idea with another, another term, because like, um, anarchism has a lot of preconceived notions. Correct. A lot of preconceived yeah. notions. Yeah. It's hard to communicate new ideas and concepts. Um, you know, with, with the baggage. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. Hang on a second, how's our time? Uh, I have two minutes. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me, let me do a follow up question, I'll come back to you. Sir. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, that I like the reasoning that you had behind uh, doing away with the legislative and executive branches. I thought that was really well thought out. Thank you. But concerning the issue of the courts, you mentioned uh, selecting jurors at random. I was wondering if it might be at all preferable, like when you consider a seat. Uh, instead of selecting a jury at random, make comprise the jury of compulsory witnesses uh, rather than uh, a random jury or perhaps a nomination of a jury. The question is, should we have uh, compulsory jurors? Well, I think I'll say the same thing about that that I said about John Locke. You're sowing the seeds of your own destruction. Because the minute you allow the state to compel anything, you're allowing the state to compel. Oh, sorry, you, 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 sir, do not have the authority to compel me to be a juror. How can you give that to the court system? I meant uh, voluntary, which is not compulsory. Oh. So oh, they are voluntary. Oh, I see. Like oh. people who are actually there and probably the Yeah, but then everybody's got an agenda. I don't care who you are, you've got an agenda. And the best way to represent that agenda is to have you sitting in that courtroom and we flip a coin. Are you on the jury? No. Are you on the jury? No. Or we do every fifth person on the jury or something like that. Some random way. So that way you can't stack a jury. You may be a professional juror and an expert on contract law, but there may be somebody else who is just has more feel for people. So I, I would say, no, it should be random. Less than a minute. I have less than a minute, sir. Under this system, uh, what defense or guarantee do we have against the ball, the ball coming back up for the state system? Because if everything is voluntary, it seems like the ball gets up and there's a disconnect between information that people have yep. and their willingness to engage in voluntary things like activism. So yep. What guarantee do we have that we can stop the ball from coming? The question is, what guarantee do we have that the ball's not going to bounce back up farther into statism? Freedom, sir, has no guarantees. Freedom is the random discourse of people serving their own ends. And if the only rule is your life, your way, as long as you respect the rights and property of others, you would have to break that rule. And as long as the majority of people in our empty state project believe in that rule, hopefully you would be outnumbered. If not, then we do what we do today. We go to war and may the best system win. Thank you very much for your attention. At the snub.com. I take off my Agora and State hat and I put on my MC hat again. Let me welcome you to the Valley Forge Beef and Ale and the Agoran Unconference. We're here live at the Valley.
Valley Forge Beef and Ale in beautiful downtown Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, part of the Agora Unconference with over 100 exciting libertarian speakers over two channels. Let me tell you about the fine people who made this possible. Our sponsors include AMCAP Entrepreneur Network, the Center for a Stateless Society, Cop Block, Freedom Phoenix, Free King, <clears throat> Liberty on Tour, Mission Liberty, Students for Liberty, and WeWon'tFly.com. <laughs> Great list of people. Our next speaker is Ron Harper. Ron is the father of five, an eighth generation Lancaster, Lancaster Countyan, I'll say it right, a graduate of the Lancaster Bible College, and a citizen investigative reporter. Too cool. Ron's reporting led directly to the firing of a corrupt police officer, the resignation of one of Pennsylvania's then most powerful legislators, a jail term for the former Lancaster City School Superintendent, and the disgrace of a sitting judge. Ron successfully sued a township police officer in federal court for a false arrest relating to the filming of police activity, and for more than a decade has used the courts to fight the open meet fight for, not fight the, fight for open meetings and records, including acting as prosecutor against government officials who violate open meeting laws. He's a descendant of the signer of the Declaration of Independence, John Morton, and Ron believes that he is obligated to continue that fight for freedom. His talk today is entitled Challenging the Cops in a Police State. Please join me in welcoming Ron Harper. <laughs> Hi, thanks a lot. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I'm listening to the, this, the Ken's talk, and what I'm really talking about is a really practical way in which I believe that we, we need to address the very life that we're living right now. Uh, how many of you feel the freedom uh, and liberty as you go about your life these days? Are you feeling free? Do you have liberty? I drove here about an hour on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and uh, along the way, I looked in my rearview mirror. I'm always looking in mine, and sure enough, there was a Smoky Bear, you know, a state cop. And this state cop uh, pulled off the side of the road, got behind someone else, and I've got to tell you, I was scared. Now, what is going on? that here I am, I, I think I'm an upstanding citizen, I, I'm a productive member of society, I'm not leeching off society, and here I am, I'm actually afraid of, 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 of a, a police officer. Now what's going on here? Now one of the things that we're, we're, uh, we're going to talk about today is the filming of police. Now I, I'm going to Read Houston v. Hill is a Supreme Court case that says the freedom of individuals to verbally oppose or challenge police action without thereby risking arrest is one of the principal characteristics by which we distinguish a free nation from a police state. All right, now what, it's, what it says, bottom line is, is we have to be able to challenge police action or we're living in a police state. Now let me tell you, my friends, if you have never challenged police action, you don't know this, but I'm telling you, we are living in a police state. Because the bottom line, my friends, is that if you challenge them in any way, if you speak up, you are going to see that Monopoly, force, power, and coercion of the, of the state. Now, one of the ways in which I protect myself, because I, I can tell you I've been fingerprinted, mugshot, I've been handcuffed the, the whole nine yards. I, I can tell you that I have no misdemeanors. Summaries, no misdemeanors. But what I'm telling you is that the way that I have learned to challenge the police state is to make sure 
that you have a trusty and reliable witness with you at all times. Now, who is that trusty and reliable witness? Well, it is a digital camera. Now, this particular digital camera cost me about 400 bucks. You can get a very similar configuration that is a, a lower grade. This is a high definition camera for 200 bucks. And here's what I'm saying to you. You carry a camera with you all the time. I never am without my video camera. Now, you may think I'm paranoid, but I'm telling you, you just wouldn't believe how frequently, how often this video camera has documented abuses, has protected me or someone else from excessive force and or abusive state. Now, the first time that I ever decided to videotape a police officer on duty, it was around 1.30 in the morning, and I was coming home from a friend, and I was in Lancaster City, Pennsylvania, and I decided, hey, here's, a, here's a, an officer driving a vehicle. I want to videotape it. So can you guess how long I was videotaping him before I was pulled over? What do you think? Two it, seconds. It, no, well, it literally was within five minutes. I am pulled over on the side of the road with not one but two police cars there and held for almost an hour as the police officers were trying to figure out what in the world are they going to do with this guy who's videotaping them and who clearly is not getting riled up by their uh, yelling and uh, threats, etc. So one of the ways that, that I decided in order to protect myself is I decided that I need to develop some practical apparatus. So this is my, I call it my cop cam tripod now. And <laughs> this, uh, this particular uh, Bogan tripod head, it's, uh, it has the, the, the grip and will stay still. It can move around. This is about 110 bucks. It's not a cheap head, but it is very, very high quality. So one of the things is I have it mounted between the seats of my uh, Ford Taurus, and it sticks out, and it can actually shoot out and get both lanes of traffic. So I do that, and then if a police officer does stop you, you take the pistol grip, you turn it, you flip the, uh, the uh, screen so that he can view himself. So because the bottom line is, is you want to clearly indicate to him that he is being filmed. Now, I, I know you, you guys probably don't know this. I'm joking. But you know what? They don't like to be filmed. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to be told you're violating the wiretap law. Now, now listen, folks. Wiretap is related to secret recordings. It, it, who doesn't know in the year 2011 that when you see a camera, a video camera, that your voice is being recorded? Now, I can tell you that one of the, the dialogue that I have with a, a police officer is I want to make sure he is aware that I'm recording him. So I tell him, sir, I, I want you to know that I'm recording your voice and that anything you say can and will be used against you. <laughs> now, 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 I can tell you that usually I have to repeat that a couple of times. I guess they're not used to hearing that. <laughs> but they, they, they'll say to me, and I, I have video of this where the officer will say, well, what do you mean by that? Me, I repeat it. And then I say, what I mean is, is that you should measure your words carefully because I'm recording them. And if you violate my constitutional rights, you are going to be in trouble. Now, I can tell you 
that it is often uh, interesting because, you know, some police officers are really nice guys. The first time that I ever decided to remotely film and videotape a police officer stopping someone else, I was in my car and I parked about 50, 50 feet away in a private parking lot. And the police officer, after he was done, saw me, drove his car up to me, realized that I was videotaping him. So he positioned his vehicle differently. He came out and he said, sir, I see you're recording me. I just want to let you know I'm recording you as well. <laughs> Can I ask what you're doing? Now, we'll talk about the Fifth Amendment, but I, I said, well, sir, I am here to ensure that this man's constitutional rights are not violated. That's why I was there, watching him perform his duties. This man, this officer, Carlisle Police, said the most amazing thing, and he is inspirational to me and should be to all police officers everywhere. Do you know what the man said to me? How am I doing? <laughs> wow, right? Seriously. He wanted to know how he was doing in, in ensuring that the man's constitutional rights were not uh, violated. This is the, the proper attitude, the proper uh, thought that should be in police officers' minds as we videotape them. Because I can tell you this, if I see some one doing something against them, I'm going to use my video and I'll be a witness for them. There's no question about it. I'm not going to sit by and let anyone, whether he's wearing a uniform or not, be abused. Okay? So this man, this uh, police officer, the, the first guy that I stopped, he also wanted to talk to me about, you know, the fact that I was recording. So I got these magnetic signs made up that say, Official Observer, America's Constitution Police. And then in red, it says, Warning, Recording Device in Use. Now, here's the key. When I talk to the officers, and this is another line that I regularly use for these guys, because they're going to challenge you, okay? And they say, well, I don't give you permission to record my voice. I say, sir, listen to me. And it's generally sirs, by the way. But, sir, let me tell you, you, uh, you don't have to be recorded. In. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? How, how can I be? If you don't want me to record your voice, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk. <laughs> See, the whole notion that as we go about, there's plenty of uh, court cases that say, look, I can take pictures of anything and anyone. Uh, there's no evidence or proof, uh, despite our 911 chest thumpers, that terrorists took pictures of any buildings or did anything related to that. I, I mean, it's a ridiculous notion. Now, here's the point, though. Uh, when you are dealing with police officers, I can tell you that I've had too many years of it and that I've had too many things happen to me that now make me less bold, that make me more concerned than ever. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. That's why I carry the video camera with me at all times. But I can tell you that one of the techniques that I use when dealing with police officers that I would highly recommend that you employ. First of all, you need to have an attitude that you are not a threat and that you're peace level. Okay? And, and I'm saying if you have a temper, if you are a brawler and like to fight, I'm telling you right now, this is not something you should be messing around with. Because police are experts experts, my friend, at poking people and getting them to respond and react. So here's, here's what I did. 
Number one, be aware that there are cameras everywhere, and there's people who could be watching you. So one of the things that I always do when I'm interacting with police, I smile. Because other people are going to see that I'm smiling. The other thing I do, I keep my hands down at my side, and I don't move around. If you're going, rah, 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 you look like a nut, right? Someone else could see that. But if they see you smiling like this with your arms down your side, you can say anything. <laughs> Someone over there has no idea what you're saying, right? This is the, I'm just telling you, the technique is you smile, be friendly. The other thing that I do is that when I'm speaking to an officer, now this is a one-on-one -on -one where I'm on the street, I make sure that I'm soft-spoken. Now, I'm, I'm speaking so you can hear me today, but when I am on the street talking, I speak very quietly. And do you know what that usually inspires people to do? Can you guess? Listen. It's listen, Speak quietly. but they also, thank you, step closer. And what do you do when an officer steps closer? Sir, please don't get in my space. That's the, uh, I, I, I make it very clear. I retreat. Other people watching, they're going to see that you're retreating and they're advancing. Now, of course, when I am speaking to an officer, I'm holding my camera. We're recording the conversation. If he's here, I get my arm backwards more to ensure that I, I get him and me as much as possible. The audio is critical in this situation. Now, to what end do we do this? To what end? I can tell you that my goal, my dream, is that we mobilize many, many people to begin regularly recording police. Because you never know when you're going to capture something awry or amiss. Now, I've actually, and if you look, this is a, a weathered shirt. I have a lot of these. I wear official observer shirts, okay? And, you know, they're, they're made to mimic, like, the FBI type, you know, the uh, official looking. And I say it's a play on words. We're official because, as Americans, we're a part of the, this government of the people, by the people. And official because we are looking at how officials act and respond, okay? Now, I can tell you that I was once following doing investigative journalist work, and I knew that a Republican committee person who had attacked somebody on the public street was going to be working at a polling place. So this person was of interest for me, and I wanted to do an interview. So, of course, I came to the polling place with my video camera rolling the moment I began to drive there. And these are, this is the other technique. Never, ever turn your camera off. Never turn it off. Always record as you're coming to a situation and as you're leaving so that there's no uh, 18 minutes of blank tape, as President Nixon had. You want to keep your tape rolling, because invariably, false accusers will use any blank moments to say, well, this is what happened then. And so I always keep my tape rolling. The other thing that I, I will tell you is that you must, at, at all times, uh, no matter how you're threatened, that you must keep the camera rolling. I don't care what they threaten you with. I don't care whether they tell you you're going to be arrested, you're going to go to jail, because I'm telling you this. You turn the camera off, and you're going to be arrested anyway. It doesn't really matter what they say. If they, whatever threat they're going to do, they're going to do to you anyway. And I'm telling you right now, the drama, uh, if you will, of having your camera taken from you, uh, you want to capture that on tape. You know, if, if not just to get YouTube hits, right? 
Okay. Now, at this particular polling place, I had she the person I was interviewing called the police out. We talked, and because I was filming, she ended up leaving. This is my lady cop story. And so she left me, drove around the block. So she was done with her job, and she parked in front of the polling place. Now, I observed her for 10 minutes sitting in front of the polling place. Now, in Pennsylvania, it's against the law for an officer in uniform to be at a polling place unless they have a, a legitimate purpose there related to their duties or to vote. Well, what did I do? Well, I can't allow this officer to violate the law, right? So I approached her on foot with my camera and I said, you know, you need to move on now. You're not allowed to park it. <laughs> and of course, she gives me this look and she says, how do I know that that isn't a gun? My camera. <laughs> no kidding. How do I know it isn't a gun? Now, this lady, if, if you don't know, I, I'm, I'm no Slim Jim. I lost 31 pounds, though, in the last six weeks. But, thank you. But, but let's just say that I weigh as much as she does on my left side. That's how little this, this woman was. She actually got out of the car and grabbed me physically, grabbed my arm and the camera, because she said, I might have a gun. Now, let me tell you. If you're a police officer and you're training, uh, would you tell some 120 pound woman that she should physically get at somebody to test whether there's a gun? No, she knew there wasn't a gun. She knew that I was no threat to her whatsoever. And, and here are the, this happens to me time and time again. But one of the key, uh, amendments that I, I tell people all the time and I get frustrated with people because I am just amazed and I'm sure many of you are at the ignorance of people are about our Constitution and our laws. Now here is a, is a rule. Guys, this is a rule. Don't talk to cops. This is not rocket science. This is not, you don't, I am not obligated to talk to a cop, period. If I kill someone and they come and they, they say, we, yay, we think you killed somebody, I don't have to respond. I don't have to say anything. And I'm telling you, when you don't get mad, don't get upset, don't get riled up, and you don't speak, I'm telling you what, they are intimidated. They are intimidated when you don't get riled up and you don't speak to them. One time I was at a, a, a gas station at a convenience store and I had my, my camera mount like this, right? And a, a state cop was in the, was in the uh, gas pump right beside me. And I, start, I saw him there, and I completely ignored him. That's the other thing. I don't even look, okay? Not that I'm rude or disrespectful, but I'm a free man, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not owned by him. In fact, he is my servant, right? I'm the master. He's the servant. They need to understand that. So anyway, I'm, at, I'm pumping gas. Hey, hey, what's that camera for? He gets out of his car. And he starts walking to me. And I turn and I said, I decline to speak to you. And he, now he's going to walk over. He's going to get in my face. I said, what is that camera for, he says. And I said, sir, I am not speaking to you. So he says, give me your driver's license and registration. Now, I could have argued with him, but I knew that there was cameras all over capturing all of this. So this was a safe place. I wasn't going to punt for down the road. I'm going to do it right here. And I said to him, sir, Pennsylvania state law requires drivers while pumping to attend to their duties. 
until I'm done with my pumping duties, I will have to do this, and then I will comply with your request. So I, of course, slowed my gas down so that it literally took me 10 minutes to pump this <laughs> gas. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I got my, my uh, license and registration. I locked the car, which, by the way, I keep a, a spare key on my car that only I know where it is, and I lock the keys in the car so he can't get to the car. Okay, he can't open the car because I don't have the keys. So I popped the, the trunk and I got out my signs and I slapped these on, America's Constitution Police. And you should have seen his eyes. This 21, 22 year old kid, and you know, I'm a father, 24 year old. He's a kid, you know? His eyes got real big and I said to him, look, sir, had you treated me with a little respect and a little courtesy, and said, hey, what's your camera for? I'd be glad to have that discussion with you. But that's not how you came. You came with the I own you attitude. Now, I, I believe that one of the keys that, and one of the things that I'm working on, and I would encourage you in your neighborhood, your police chief, you need to get to know. I regularly meet with my local police chief. And here's the reason why. Dude, you cannot influence anyone that you don't have a relationship with. I'll repeat that. You can't influence anyone you don't have a relationship with. And I ended with a preposition. I shouldn't do that. I guess. But, but the point, though, is that you must befriend and get along with people enough that you can talk to them and have these conversations. So I encourage you. Call your local police chief. Invite him out, hey, for a donut. You know, whatever. Buy him a donut. <laughs> um, you know, whatever, whatever he wants. But get a, a relationship so that he can understand that freedom and liberty begins with being able to travel without being harassed by a roving police. Thank you. I did want to show you that this is, you know, I haven't finished looking. It actually is just pipe that you can get at a hardware store. You get the corrugated pipe and it looks almost professional, right? All right, thanks. <laughs> Does he rock or what? Yes. 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 Get me one of those. <laughs> All right, take a deep breath. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Agora IO Conference. We are live at the Valley Forge Beef and Ale. My name is Ken Krawchuk. I'll be your MC today. We are part of the overall Agora IO Conference, unconference with over 100 exciting libertarian speakers broadcasting live over the internet on two channels. We're going to be here all day. We're ready now for our next speaker. Our next speaker is Steve Sheets. Steve is the chairman of the Montgomery County Libertarian Party. He says he discovered libertarianism by listening to the Irv Homer show in the late 80s in the Philadelphia market. Steve is now involved in numerous freedom activities. His interest in agorism has emerged, emerged as a result of his frustration with libertarians who are constantly attempting to negotiate with the statists. Steve's talk today is going to focus on the topic of selling agorism. Steve Sheets! wonderful day it is today to be outside and talking about liberty. Is it not? Yes. Yeah. 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 Agorism is free market. How many of you people here are entrepreneurs? There's a few of you. There's a few of you. How many of you people have a solid work ethic that you believe that you don't get anything for free in this world? Unfortunately, 
There are too few of us. There really are. When I began as a libertarian, I started working in the 1990s, helping out libertarian candidates like Lee Houston when he ran in the 13th district for Congress. The problem that I had 